I think we've covered in our time a lot of the major arguments. Are there any others that you want to touch on before we finish that you I hear? I would just like to make one last comment. Uh, the difference between me and 99% of your listeners is I've studied this for 15 years. I know the details. I know what happened before October 7th. And my view is if people were as close to the reality before October 7th, uh, they would not at all be surprised by my opinions. I think you meant 50 years, though, right? No, because I started in 1982 with Israel's war in Lebanon, and I studied the conflict as a whole for 40 years. I started studying Gaza closely about 2005. Okay. So I would count it 15 years just focused on yeah, Gaza. I just didn't want to leave out all that time you spent studying yeah, the a, region as a, a bro- whole. Yeah, as a bro- whole, yes. But just that tiny... I never... Um, you know, after... Um, After October 7th, I became, uh, I had a certain name and face recognition. But I never expected it. Quite the contrary, by 2020, I had given up. I stopped writing, I wrote other books on other subjects. And I felt, you know, to be honest, I felt mentally liberated um, because... uh, I wanted to think about different things. My life had passed, and I didn't. Um, and I didn't do everything I wanted to do with it. Everything I had started out thinking I would do with it. Uh, by 2020, you know, I always say I'm not a quitter. That's why I started in '82, and I wasn't going to give up until this thing found a resolution. By 2020, I thought it was hopeless. I gave up, and I moved on with an element of, of course, guilt um, about that. And then October 7 happened, and I had written the only political history of Gaza, so I was now in demand. Um, but I, I, never, um, I never did it for that reason. I did it because... I felt what those people had endured deserved to be remembered. And at the very end of the book, the Gaza book, uh, I write, there was a famous book on what happened to the Native Americans uh, by this woman at the end of the late 19th, at the end of the 19th century, uh, Helen Hunt, uh, Helen Hunt Jackson. It's called A Century of Dishonor. And it just chronicled what was done to the Native Americans. Very ugly. Very, very ugly. And when I read that, so I thought it was kind of like what I wanted to do in this book. So I write, the present volume was modeled after Helen Hunt Jackson's book, A Century of Dishonor. The author holds out faint hope that it will find, meaning my book, will find an audience among his contemporaries. Still, the truth should be preserved. It's the least that's owed the victims. Perhaps one day in the remote future, when the tenor of the times is more receptive, someone will stumble across this book collecting dust on a library shelf, blow off the cobwebs, and be stung by outrage at the lot of a people, meaning the uh, Gazans, if not forsaken by God, then betrayed by the cupidity and corruption, careerism and cynicism, craveness and cowardice, of mortal men. And so I just, I never expected any kind of 
recognition of what I was doing. I didn't expect. My last book, Young Gaza, I accuse. And I, it sold 370 copies, of which I bought half. <laughs> so I just felt it was an obligation, a moral obligation. And that's why I did it. And then, unexpectedly, October 7th happened. And uh, not that I ever made it. There's, all, there's this kind of optical illusion, which I'm sure you're aware of from the web, meaning I've never been... To this day, I've never been on national television in the United States. I've never been on national radio. I've never really been on, I was on one local program, I think somewhere in Tennessee. I have vague recollection of it. I've never been on television and almost never on radio. Um, and even now, you will never see, even though it's the only political history of Gaza, the only one, you'll never see it mentioned. Absolutely never. You know how in the port in journals, they'll say, here are some recommended background reading. They'll have a few. Never mentioned. Never. Unmentionable. The only reason I... I uh, and people will say, oh, you're doing interviews all the time. Actually, I'm not. What happens is because I have the recognition, whenever I, whenever I do appear, it gets lots of views, you know, very quickly because of who I, of, there's a large number of people who respect... Uh, and trust what I have to say. But most of it is just a handful of people. I, I've only done really a handful of podcasts, but you know what it is because you do this stuff. They chop it into one-minute things and two minutes, so it looks like people think, oh, I'm being interviewed all the time. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Hardly at all. The only mainstream programs I was on, relatively mainstream, or where Lex Fridman and Pierce Morgan. That's it. Otherwise, all small podcasts. Well, I have a, a couple of follow-ups just because your publication career is actually quite interesting and I've read a bit about it. But first, I'm just curious about what you did with 185 copies of Gaza. Oh, Excuse. because that was directed at the International uh, Criminal Court. There was a case going on there when... Uh, the chief prosecutor was Fatou Ben Souda. And Ben Souda was, in my opinion, either being bribed or blackmailed by Israel. Eventually came out that Israel was attempting to blackmail her, was documented. Uh, and so I was, I purchased them to give to the everybody at the ICC, which is for your audience. There are two legal bodies in the world, the International Court of Justice, which is the judicial arm, of the United Nations, and then there's the International Criminal Court, which is a totally separate entity. So I was trying to influence the opinion in the ICC by presenting my documentation. <laughs>